I'm excited as always, church, uh, to bring to you the word of God this morning. I want to start off by um, dismissing uh, the children. Uh, if you have any kids that are K-5, uh, the workers are in the back. Uh, they'll be uh, ready and willing to receive them. Uh, so feel free uh, to dismiss them at this time. I want to also begin by confessing to you guys that I am the backup preacher this morning. Uh, so Kevin, uh, he is sick. Uh, he got sick this past week. Um, so he let me know on Thursday uh, that he wasn't going to be able to be here this morning. Um, and so I'm bringing to you God's word. Uh, so this sermon is a little bit rough around the edges. Now you know why. Um, and so we will um, open up this treasure chest uh, that is God's word uh, this morning. This text is actually the text that I was the most excited about um, in this section of scripture. Uh, so interestingly enough, the Lord has brought things kind of full circle um, and allowing us to be able to talk about this this morning. One of the things that I pray about for Aletheia uh, as a church for very consistently is unity. Uh, it's a frequent prayer of mine uh, that we will be unified as a body. And the desire that all of us are of the same mind um, and that we ultimately have the same heartbeat is a primary concern of mine because I grew up in exceptional disunity. I know what it's like for people not to get along and what it's like for people not to agree, not to be willing to work together. And so I've asked and I do continue to ask the Lord to make all of us one very, very often. And I believe this is in accordance with God's will. Uh, he tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 how he feels about unity. And one of our marks as a church, uh, so it's important that you guys as a body, as a community, as members um, and beyond, know what we believe in terms of our vision frame, the vision of the church. But one of our marks as a church is that we fill our minds with truth. And so we should all be moving towards the same eternal kingdom, worshiping the same king with the same ultimate aim and purpose in mind in every single thing that we do. And now this next thought might be particularly painful for some people in this room. Some of you may not care at all, uh, but this next thought might be particularly painful, so I've braced you. You're prepared. Here we go. So as I think about unity, um, something that always pops into my mind when I think about unity um, is um, a couple memories uh, related to this one thing. I can remember so many times that I would be in an airport flying somewhere, um, and I would be wearing orange and blue, and I would have this little gator head on my shirt, and just random strangers would walk up to me and say, go Gators. And that's always like super fun, and like super cool. And I have very frequent memories of an incredible fourth down pass being thrown um, in the swamp. Um, or maybe in the swamp, you know, a running back just kind of breaks free. Um, he rushes in for a touchdown. Um, and just hearing those 90,000 people like as one, all unified, celebrating together are some of my fondest memories. I love those moments whenever we're like walking through the tunnel after the game is over and you hear that chant, it's great to be a Florida Gator. And one of my initial memories of the university was orientation, what, what UF calls preview. At preview, I'll never forget uh, those ambassadors for the university running into the room on both sides. And for the first time, you're hearing that chant, it's great to be, you know the rest. <laughs> so... When I think about unity, that's like one of the first things I think about. Like those moments are so fun. Um, and there's been so many great times all together just being of the same mind, having the same uh, desire, the same excitement over the same thing. There are very few things in this world as powerful as unity. You can get all people together about the same thing. Very few things as powerful as that. And as fun as some of those moments can be, they pale in comparison to the unity that should be experienced by the people and the children of God. That type of unity, the unity of God's people, is the type of unity that we see our Savior asking for in this text of Scripture that's before us this morning. We've been going through the Gospel of John since the second week of the year, and I'm delighted this morning to continue to lead us through this amazing book. So look with me again in John chapter 17. We're going to begin in verse 1, read down to verse 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, 
the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified your name on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. My first point this morning is that Jesus prays for himself. Jesus prays for himself. God the Son lifts himself up. In, these, uh, in this passage, in these words. You see, this is six weeks before he would ascend to heaven. Our Savior shared these words with his disciples, the gathered 11. At this point, Judas was absent. This is late into Thursday night, maybe even early Friday morning, the day that he would die. They might still be in the room where they had the Last Supper, or they could be walking to the garden. Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, John doesn't tell us exactly where they are in chapter 17, but somewhere at a point before he would pray alone in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus shares the words that we read this morning. And I love how God very frequently brings things full circle. The last time I preached to you guys earlier this year, uh, we looked at John chapter 2. We looked at the wedding at Cana, and we read these words. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. You see, Jesus told his mom that his hour had not yet come. And if you've been following along closely in John, this is a statement that he's given multiple times throughout this chapter, throughout this word. But finally, his hour has come. The hour of his crucifixion has arrived. You see, there is a divine timetable and there is a divine appointment. What hour is this? This is the hour of his crucifixion, the hour of his death. He was finally going to pay the price for sin so that sinners can be reconciled to God. Finally, redemption was at hand. And what they thought was all shameful, a shameful death, bare and broken on a cross, was actually not in fact all shame, but all glory. This was the hour of fulfillment, the hour to do the redemptive work the hour of glorification. He is finally going to die, to resurrect, to ascend, and become seated at the right hand of the Father. And I have to warn you guys as we just worked through John 17 that I'm not going to exposit every word in this incredibly rich text. There's been 500-page books written on John 17 alone. There's been entire sermons on every verse in this entire section, um, you'll be delighted to know I'm not going to be that exhaustive this morning. Uh, but I do want us to take a look at the highlights and see some of the mountain peaks in this incredible text that God has given us. This is a chapter composed of layers of love. And I want you to see that this morning. You see, prayer was central in the life of our Lord. He was a model of prayer. Incredibly constant and incredibly consistent was he. This prayer that God's Son offers here is the prayer above all prayers. And I often tell people that what we call the Lord's Prayer, um, you know how it goes. Um, Josh actually referenced it earlier. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer is actually not the Lord's Prayer. I tell people that all the time. You see, this isn't the Lord's Prayer. That isn't the Lord's Prayer because Jesus can't actually pray those words. You know, in those words, he says, um, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And he has nothing to be forgiven of. He was entirely sinless. He was entirely blameless. See, a better name for that prayer would be the model prayer. And Matthew even tells us this, right? Matthew says in Matthew 6, 9, he says, pray then like this. It's a model prayer. No, that's not the Lord's prayer. But this prayer... In John 17, this is the Lord's prayer. 
This is a prayer above all prayers. This is a firsthand opportunity to hear the Lord's heartbeat for his people. He is our great high priest, and he goes to the Father on our behalf. The truths that we see here are truly beyond comprehension. They give us a peek behind the veil. We glimpse with an intimate view a window into the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. Our Savior in great humility came to earth to become a man, yet he remained God. And even the Son of God is dependent on Father God. And if this is true for him, how much more so is this true that we should be dependent on our Father as well? The first person of the Trinity could have used any earthly analogy or example to explain his relationship with the second person of the Trinity. But he chose father and son. Why? Why would he do that? I think for four reasons among other reasons. One is they're an expression of each other's image. They have a shared nature. They have intimate familiarity. And they have great personal care. That's what's true of fathers and sons. That's what should be true of fathers and sons. Between the father and the son is the unity of a common mind, purpose, an unqualified mutual love, and a sustained, comprehensive togetherness in mission. What a beautiful window we get into the relationship between the first two persons of the Godhead. And do you want to know what Jesus is doing right now in heaven? Like what is God the Son? What is Jesus doing right this very second in heaven? We see him begin this work in John 17. He is interceding for us. And don't we need that? He is asking the Father and sending the Spirit to preserve our faith to keep us in the love of God. He is asking God to give us what we need the most. And he is constantly bringing to God the needs that we have. And what a tender and caring high priest we have. He goes to God on behalf of his people. And something that could stick out to you that's a little bit odd is that Jesus would pray for himself. The self-focus of this prayer could catch us off guard. If we were to be this self-focused, we would feel a sense of guilt. But not so with our Lord. He is asking for something that he deserves. Fallen creatures struggle with this concept. But God is far above us. He is worthy of worship. He is worthy of utter devotion. He is worthy not just of being prayed for, but being prayed to. There is glory due his name, and all of our focus should be on him. His glory is his beauty, his weight, his honor, and his splendor. That is his glory. He is glorious. Jesus is deserving of glory for two reasons. One, because of who he is, he is God. And two, because of what he has done, what he has done for his people. And let's settle for a second on this thought, Jesus being worthy of receiving glory. It making sense that Jesus would pray a very self-focused prayer. He makes several startling statements in John 17. He plainly says here that he is God. He is the eternal God. He was a man, but he wasn't just a man. He was and in fact is the only true God. And Colossians tells us this. Colossians in chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, the word says these words. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That's who Paul tells us that he is. And then the author of Hebrews says, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited that is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels wince and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. Like a garment, they will change. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. I think that the author of Hebrews and Paul having written Colossians, is really clear on the identity of Jesus. He wasn't just a man. He wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just some great guy who said great things that we like to quote. No, he was and self-identified as the God of gods, the only God, the Lord God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. He is the second person of the Trinity, Three persons, one God. And we can't plumb the depths of the Trinity, but we do acknowledge the reality that God is three persons and one essence. Jesus was not created. He was the creator. He didn't receive life. In him was life. He is the preexistent one. He is preexistent, coexistent, and self-existent. And here's a theological word for you this morning, aseity. And aseity just means that he is life itself. He is life itself. Or to use the words that God gave Moses at the burning bush, a passage that you're probably familiar with out of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, God says, I am who I am. He is the self-existent one. John 8, verses 48 through 59, when we went through that passage, we read these words. The Jews answered him, are we not right in saying 
that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus very plainly says that he equates himself to God. He says that he is. And I love in, in the text of scripture whenever Jesus goes ghost mode and he totally goes ghost mode in this, in this moment. He just like disappears. He just hides himself and gets out of, the, out of the, the crowd there because at that point his hour had not yet come. They would have killed him. Uh, he, from their perspective, he had blasphemed God by equating himself with God. But all he did was tell the truth. He told them who he really, truly was. And it's a marvelous thing that him being God, his desire is to give eternal life to all those whom God has given him. This is what he tells us in verse 2 of John 17. You see, eternal life is full knowledge of God. Full knowledge, fully known, deeply loved by God, perfectly loved by God. To have eternal life is to fully know God and to be fully known by God. To be fully loved by God. To be perfectly loved by God. That's what it means to have eternal life. And that's why we can have that life now and then for eternity and then forever. And this type of life should be an all-consuming, exhilarating joy for us to have this type of life in God, in Christ. Let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me and they have received them. And I've come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. He not only prays for himself, but he also prays for the 11. Jesus gives us a review of his ministry to the disciples. The first thing that he talks about here um, is the world, and I want to kind of quickly define that for you. Uh, so to define the word world, this is the system of the unredeemed. It's those who are not of God. It's the system of demons and unredeemed humanity. Those ruled by sin, who belong to the devil, are anti-Christ and anti-God. That's the world. And the Father gave Jesus, gave Jesus his disciples out of the world. He called them to leave the worldly system. And he called them out of the mass of humanity who rebel against God. He called them out. He also says that he manifested his name. He manifested his name. And this means that he displayed God's identity, his nature, his attributes, his words, his works, his will, 
his purposes and his plan. He revealed the Father to us all. He manifested his name. And he says, whom you gave me. He tells us in verse 6 that God the Father gave people to God the Son. And he repeats this idea seven times in this chapter. And so this is probably something that we should land on for a second. And we should take a look at. So let's do that. The disciples were given to the Son by the Father. The disciples were a gift from the Father to the Son. We have been given to Christ by God our Father. How precious are you? So precious that you are a love gift from God to God. And this idea of a God gift is particularly special to me because of my name. So my first name is Theodore, uh, for those of you who only call me Theo. Um, And Theodore literally means gift of God. So Theo means God, and Dor means gift. And so when I read these words and I hear about these thoughts, like it's particularly special to me because it's this idea that is like captured up in like what my mom decided to call me because that's what my dad was called. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's like so unique and, and, and so um, particularly precious and special to me that Jesus would give us this idea that the 11, his disciples and all of us who proclaim and know Jesus, that we are gifts from God to God. You see, have you ever given a gift to someone with great love and devotion and tender care behind that gift? That is what the father did when he gifted the son, the people whom are in him. Our savior says in essence, before everything existed, they were yours, father. And what a stunning reality that is. Before they were called or converted, before they knew anything or believed, they were the fathers. Or let's read how Paul puts that idea in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. I want to read it to you in ESV, and then I want to read it to you in CSB. Um, I want to do ESV to be faithful to what we do here, and then I want to read it in CSB to, make it more, uh, to help it to make more sense to you. So here we go. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you. Brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. That word first fruits doesn't really translate for us. We don't, we don't use that word first fruits in like modern day America. So, so let me read it to you in CSB. CSB says, 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 2, verse 13, but we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. You see, they are gods. They were gods at the beginning. They were given by God to God. In John chapter 6, again, a passage that we've already preached through and that we've already worked through, uh, in verse 37, puts it like this, the same idea, puts it like this. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then we'll jump down to verse 44, which says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And I love what 
I feel like those, those words are super clear. But I love what Spurgeon says about this idea. Spurgeon, my, my great hero. He says, if he had meant to cast you away, he would have done so long ago. If he wanted reasons for rejecting you, he had reasons from all eternity, for he knew what you would be. No sin in you has been a surprise to him. You see, despite that, you, believer, are precious to God. You, believer, are a gift from God to God. The Father chooses, the Father draws, the Father gives, the Son receives, the Son keeps, the Son raises, and no one is lost. And perhaps you remember that incredible story in the book of Jonah where God displays his love for outsiders to Jonah. You remember that the word of the Lord came to Jonah and Jonah decided that he was going to disobey and rebel against God. He was going to be a good countryman and instead of going to the Ninevites, those outsiders, those people beyond the Jews, he was going to instead flee as far away as he could from the presence of the Lord. And so Jonah gets into this boat and he sails away. Um, he tries to flee from God and God just destroys everything. And eventually Jonah makes his way into the belly of this great fish. And then you remember the fish, it, it um, gets him back on land. Um, and he's on the, the land. And as Jonah's there, the word of the Lord comes to him a second time. And I'm so grateful that God speaks to us a second time, that he gives us a second chance. And that's what he does with, with Jonah. He gives Jonah a second chance. And the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, and this time Jonah obeys. And this time Jonah does what God told him to do. This time he goes into the city of Nineveh, that great city, that massive city, and he proclaims the word of the Lord. And he calls out to them to repent, to turn to God, to believe in this God of Israel. And God does this miraculous thing. The word tells us from the least of them to the greatest of them, all the way up to the very king himself. The king tears his robes and gets off of his throne and puts his face into the ground. And they all repent. And they all turn to God. And they believe in God. And God leads this massive revival in this place full of outsiders and those who didn't know God. God changes their hearts and all the people in the city believe and they make it into God's kingdom. You see, what they didn't know is that God, God the Father, loved them and he wanted to know them despite their rebellion and sin against him, despite the idol worship that they had and all the evil deeds that they did. See, what they didn't know is that God wanted to have them. And maybe there are some people in this room who are Ninevites. Like you don't know that God wants to have you, that he wants to gift you to his son, that the father wants to make you new and show his love to you. I submit to you, Jesus, Ask him to come to you. Ask him to allow you to receive him. And I implore you today to believe in Jesus, to trust in him, to make him your Lord and your Savior, to make him your king and your God. Ask him today to have you, and he will. You see, he died a criminal's death. He died a death that he did not deserve. I'm so excited that we get a chance to see that in the next couple weeks. Like I told you, John 17 is the day that he's about to die. So we're about to look at this over the next couple weeks. Um, and then we're going to transition it into some other things and talk about um, Christmas and Jesus being born. But we're about to see his death. He died a criminal's death so that you can be forgiven by God for all the sins that you've ever committed. He wants you today to believe in him, to receive him. All you have to do is trust him and turn from your way and turn to his way. 
Would you allow the son to receive his gift today? I wish I could do that for you. I wish that I could, I could on your behalf receive him for you. But you have to make that decision. And this is what he prays. He prays that we would believe in him. And he goes on in verse 9 to say, I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. The third thing that we see is that Jesus continues to pray for the 11. He prays for his followers. In verses 9 through 19, he gives this really specific prayer for those who follow him. Our God prays for his followers so that all of them will get to glory. All of them will get to God's kingdom in heaven. He intercedes for his followers to get us through the ups and downs of life. Our battles with sin, doubts, fears, struggles, and griefs. He intercedes to get us ultimately to glory. And there's so much which could lead us away from him. So much that could annihilate our faith if that were possible. But Jesus prays for his 11 and he prays for us. And this is a wonderful example of intercessory prayer. We have been very God-centered this morning, and rightly so, but the word of God is very balanced. God knows our nature. He knows that if we were to leave here thinking that only God could do things and it's all God and like we have like no like actions to take in this thing of life and salvation and belief in him, he knows that if we were to leave here with that, idea that we would just be irresponsible and we would probably not live faithfully like we should. And so I love that Jesus says a couple things in this text. In verse 6, he says that the 11 kept your word. And then in verse 8, he says that they received God's word. And then in verse 8, he also says that they believed. He says they kept his word, they received his word, and they believed his word. You see, it's imperative that faith is exercised. You have to do something to be saved. But it's not what most people think that you have to do. No, there's no works in salvation. You can't do enough good things to get into God's kingdom. You can't help enough old ladies or be good to enough children or even give enough money to get into God's kingdom. None of those actions, none of those works can ever get you there. You see, you have to do something, but that something is not a work. That something is an act of faith. You have to personally, intentionally, individually believe in the truth of who Jesus says that he is. You must believe that he is the Lord of Lords. And you have to accept his sacrifice on your behalf on the cross. It's not just an act of God to be brought to salvation, but it's a decision 
made consciously and willfully by men to know God's son. I love how he shows us that here in this text. They did act in faith and trust and believe and receive all the words that Jesus said about his father and himself. The next idea I want you guys to see in this text is this this petition for protection. And I think about that uh, because I'm a nerd. I think back to 1943 and 1944. And I think back to this uh, period of time where during World War II, the Allies were trying to disrupt the fuel lines of Nazi Germany. And so Nazi Germany um, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, what is now uh, the Republic of Serbia, uh, which is particularly special to some people in this room, um, in that particular area, um, the Nazis had this big uh, area where they would uh, get oil and produce fuel. And so to disrupt that, what the Allies did was they sent fighters and bombers over to that area to try to destroy uh, the, the German fuel uh, sources. And so as these bombers and fighters, they struck their targets, the Nazis counterattacked uh, with unrelenting ferocity. And several Allied planes were shot down, and about 400 servicemen survived uh, their planes being shot down. And in Prajani, Serbia, the local Serbs fed and sheltered the airmen, and they risked their lives to protect them from the Nazis. Under the direction of local leaders, the airmen were kept in Prajani because the mountains and the hills hit them well from the Germans. The local population, after a while, could not continue to feed and take care of that many pilots and crew for very long. Um, And so as a result of that, they needed to be rescued out of Serbia, out of that area, um, and brought back into Allied territory. And so a daring rescue mission was launched uh, to grab these captured Allied troops. And this was the largest Allied airlift behind enemy lines during the entirety of World War II. And this mission was known as Operation Howard. And it was successful. And it's one of the more famous stories of its kind in modern history. There's one testimony from a survivor, uh, Richard Feldman, uh, that went like this that I, I thought you guys would find particularly interesting. Uh, Feldman says, No sacrifice was too great for the Serbian people in making us comfortable. It was they who sheltered us in the hills and in their farmhouses, often at great risk to themselves. Those of us who were wounded received whatever medical supplies were available. If there was one slice of bread in the house or one egg, it went to an American. If there was one blanket or one bed, it went to the American while our Serbian host slept on the bare ground. Many of the peasants were tortured, tortured to death, because they would not tell the Germans where we were. And he recounts just how special it meant for them to be served in this way by the Serbian people and protected until they were able to get airlifted out of there. They were stranded and they were needy. These allied troops really needed protection. And they found that protection at great cost to their protectors. They, like our Lord, gave protection to others at significant cost to themselves, the Serbian people did. And Jesus prays for the 11 and that we will be kept in the Father's name. He prays for the eternal security of the believers. He prays for protection. And this wasn't the first time that we see Jesus praying for protection. You might remember where uh, he does this for Peter. This is getting close to his death in in Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 31. Jesus says, Simon, Simon. Let me just pause you there for a second. Anytime Jesus calls Peter Simon, it's because he's acting like the old man. Because he renamed him Peter. But when he's acting like the old man, he calls him Simon. Uh, It's a little, little Bible insight. So Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. 
See, Satan wanted to, to destroy Peter, but Jesus prays for him. He intercedes for him. He gets in the middle between Satan and Peter, and he says, no, you're going to be strong. You're going to be weak, and then you're going to be strong. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. He not only prays for our protection, but he also prays that we will be one. He desires our oneness. And to be saved is to be made one, to be unified, not just to one another. Oh, no, this is far deeper than us being unified to one another. We're to be unified to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. We are in the Father, and we are in the Son, and we are in the Holy Spirit. We have the Father in us, and we have the Son in us, and we have the Holy Spirit within us. And this is why Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, with that reality, these words make sense. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, when Jesus died, I died. And he says, this life that I live is in my life. It's his life. Because of this reality that Jesus is praying for in John 17, that we are in him and he is in us. That's what it means to be in Christ, those great words in the epistles. To be a believer is to be loved with an infinite love, the same love that the Father has for the Son, eternal, everlasting, limitless love that pulls us into the Trinity itself. He says that the Father loves the 11 just as he loves the Son. And that's an overwhelming truth, that God loves you exactly like he loves his son. That's that's perfect love. That's undeserved love. But despite all that unity, there was one on the outside. There was an outsider among the 12 the entire time. Judas wasn't in and then out. No, he was never in. He was the son of perdition, to quote the KJV. And perdition just means ruin, destruction, waste. He was a child of destruction who had tried to destroy the son of God. Judas' betrayal didn't surprise God. He says that the scripture might be fulfilled. It was prophesied long ago. That betrayal was known from the very beginning, and he loved and provided for the traitor anyway. But even that betrayal would not take away the Son of God's joy. That's what he says next, isn't it? He asked that we would have Jesus' joy. And joy is just significant delight. It's great pleasure. It's extreme gladness. The Son of God wants us to experience tremendous joy, he says. And again, this is kind of this is kind of jarring to us. We all know that we have difficulties. Our sorrows are are overwhelming sometimes. But even these 11, even these guys, are going to all be martyred for their faith. And so how can they have joy? They can have joy because they have God's Spirit. They can have joy from the Holy Spirit. They have access to Jesus' joy. See, joy is based on the unshakable promises that will all come true. Every promise that God has ever made in his word is going to happen. It will all come true. And that's where their joy was rooted. The motivation for the cross was the father's love for the son and the son's love for the father. The joy that was in the cross was the father's love for the son and the son's love for the father. Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 2 says, Therefore, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the cross for joy. His motivation was joy. Jesus' greatest joy is the glory of his Father. And the glory of God is the supreme joy of his people. And it might seem strange to you that one can be fully submitted to God and yet joyful. I just said that all of these guys are going to die. And yet all of these guys are going to have tremendous joy this 11. That's kind of a strange concept. You might ask, how could I be joyful if I have to be submitted to God like this? If I have to be less than God? If I'm inferior to God, how can I be joyful in that? And that's a good question. It's one of the paradoxes of our faith. But I believe that some of the simple realities of everyday life give us a window and a picture into this idea. I love uh, these words from John Piper. He says this about this idea. What words might the Holy Spirit use to open someone to the truth that their inferiority to God is good news? Perhaps this. What if we ask someone, would you want to watch a football game where all the players were no better than you? Or watch a movie where the actors could act no better than you and were no better looking than you? Or go to a museum to see pictures by painters who could paint no better than you. Why are we willing to be exposed in all these places as utterly inferior? How can we get so much joy out of watching people magnify their superiority over us? The biblical answer is that we were made by God to get our deepest joys, not from being superior ourselves, but from enjoying God's superiority. All these other experiences are parables. God's superiority is absolute in every way, which means our joy in it may be greater than we could ever imagine. To truly be submitted to God and to know God is to be filled with incredible joy. He is worthy of all of our worship and attention. The more absorbed you are in him, the more joyful you can become. He says that we are to be consecrated for service in the truth, verses 17 through 19. When he says, sanctify them, he is asking for God to set us apart to do his works and his plans. When he says that he consecrates himself, he means that he is setting himself to do the Father's will alone. And truly, sanctification is consecration to serve. And so as the band comes back up, I want you guys to leave this morning with three takeaways. Three takeaways. Three things that I hope that you have received and that you can see from God's word this morning. The first is we see why we worship Jesus. If you came in here this morning or if you've forgotten or if you just had a particularly long week like I have and you just like haven't been able to put your eyes, set your eyes particularly on the Lord I hope that this morning you leave remembering why we worship Jesus. Why is it that we sing all these songs about him? Why so much focus on him? I also want you to take away this idea that we get a glimpse into Jesus' heart. We get an opportunity to see what he cares about. And we see that he cares about his people being protected and known and guarded and saved in him. And the third thing is, I hope that you can see why we should love and trust him. If you leave this morning loving Jesus more and trusting him more, then you fulfill the word. I hope that you leave this place different than how you came in. And I hope that you love your Savior more than you did when you woke up this morning. Those are our takeaways. And so maybe there are a few questions that you're asking yourself. Do you know the Jesus that we have described this morning? Have you ever submitted your life to his lordship? Is he your God? 
And if he is all of those things to you, are you trusting him as your intercessor? Have you kept his word? Are you of the world or sent into the world? Have you believed his word? And are you daily receiving him into yourself? Do you have Jesus' joy? A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the gospel in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life.